What is up everybody? This is Ambulance Boy. And in this video, I wanted to address EMS response to coronavirus, officially known as COVID-19. Since this started around December, I have noticed how poorly educated the public has been about this disease. With all the conflicting and oftentimes fake information out there, it has been hard not to be concerned. In this video, I hope to be able to alleviate some of those concerns and also educate you all in how to be better prepared as EMS professionals. Before this video begins, I want to give a disclaimer. I am not licensed to give you training on how to operate. These are my informed opinions that you can take or leave. Remember to always follow your local and state guidelines concerning this topic. Let me introduce myself. I am a nationally certified EMT with many years of experience. I have sadly witnessed how EMS is oftentimes unprepared and uneducated for these types of situations. This is the reason that prompted me to make the video. I hope it will help you to stay safe and healthy. I will be going over the following topics in order. What is coronavirus? Where did it originate? How does it spread? And finally, what we as EMS professionals can do to be more proactive in this fight against COVID-19. According to the CDC, coronavirus is a group of viruses that are found in animals. COVID-19 is in this group as well as the previous MERS and SARS outbreaks. While usually these viruses are only spread from animal to animal, this strain, like the ones mentioned before, have actually spread to humans as well. Coronavirus causes respiratory infections with symptoms ranging from mild to severe. Some people, like children, can have mild to no symptoms, while others, like the elderly, can become extremely ill. Some symptoms include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. In severe cases, it can lead to pneumonia or death. It was first noticed by Dr. Li Wenliang around December. He stated that it was similar to the SARS outbreak of 2002. Sadly, he became infected and died in February. This specific strain's origin is believed to have originated from bats. It is still not fully understood how this transfer happened, but it is thought to be linked to Huanan Seafood Wholesale Market, which is a live food market in Wuhan, the capital of Hubei province. The market was later closed and quarantined by Chinese health officials. Because coronavirus is a respiratory disease, it is mainly spread by close contact, which is defined as less than six feet, or through respiratory droplets when an infected person coughs or sneezes. The virus then enters the body through the mouth, nose, or eyes. This is why it is very important to keep your distance unless you are properly protected. Another way of infection is through contact with objects that an infected individual coughed on or touched. Because it is not known how long the virus can last on surfaces, it is recommended to thoroughly clean all contaminated objects. Once infected, the CDC states that the incubation period is 2 to 14 days, while other sources say it can be up to 21 days. Even if a person is not showing symptoms, they can still spread the illness to others. That is why it is important to test family or friends who have come in contact with the infected person. Currently, there is no cure or vaccine for COVID-19. Treatment is focusing on symptoms and providing support so the body can fight the infection. We have all experienced how a call can turn out to be totally opposite of what we thought it would be. As EMS professionals, we are often thrown into uncertain and unsafe situations. Because of this, critical thinking is key. When we think about scene safety, we think of car accidents or assaults. While these calls do have their dangers, we oftentimes overlook how unsafe the call for a sick patient can be. We don't always know what the patient has or if it is contagious or not. So what should we be doing to prepare for these calls during this unclear time? When we get the call, we should start thinking what we will need for that particular emergency. Car accidents need a high visibility vest and head face protection. 
and assaults will need police presence. But what do we do for the regular sick calls? When someone needs help in an emergency, they call 911 and are connected with an emergency operator. The operator should then be trying to understand the nature and location of the emergency and what resources will be needed to handle it. While doing so, the dispatcher should also be getting basic information like pertinent medical history and screening the call for potential hazards to emergency crews. It is recommended that the dispatcher should have a modified caller query for any PUIs or persons under investigation. A PUI is someone who is likely to have COVID-19. When the first outbreak of the virus happened, the criteria for a PUI was someone with symptoms who had traveled from mainland China in the last 14 days or someone who was exposed to a confirmed case of COVID-19. With the spread of the virus now worldwide, a PUI is more difficult to determine. Any respiratory infection or pneumonia of unknown origin should raise red flags. In a perfect world, the dispatcher should be letting us know if we are going to a potential PUI. As we all know, this is not a perfect world, and oftentimes the information we receive from dispatch isn't always accurate. Because of this, we always have to be prepared for anything. For example, a call for a patient with trouble breathing and fever should make us think about the possibility of an infectious disease. If you are accompanied by police or fire, try to get information about the situation from them if they arrive before you. If you are an EMS unit responding alone, keep a high index of suspicion when entering the scene. When approaching the patient, maintain a distance of at least six feet until you rule out coronavirus or until you are properly protected. Look for signs of an infectious illness such as fever, coughing, rhinorrhea, aka runny nose, dyspnea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Note that these symptoms do not always indicate an infectious disease, but with the risk of coronavirus, for our safety, we have to assume an infectious illness until proven otherwise by a negative test result. If you have a suspicion of coronavirus, you would then want to don all the necessary PPE, including a fit-tested NIOSH certified N95 or higher respirator, eye protection, a gown, and a pair of disposable examination gloves. If you are not sure you have the right PPE or have not been shown the proper use of it, then make sure your EMS agency trains you in the proper use and disposal of PPE as well as fit test you for a respirator. When evaluating the PUI, only bring in absolutely necessary equipment and personnel. If out in public, make sure that bystanders are aware and stay away from the patient. Be careful when performing aerosol generating procedures such as ventilation or suctioning. According to the CDC, all ventilatory equipment should have HEPA filtration for expired air. When you are with the PUI, make sure to put a mask on the patient. If oxygen is needed, place a nasal cannula on the patient and then put the mask over it. Before moving on, I want to make a distinction between a mask and a respirator. Mask is referring to a flu mask and respirator is referring to an N95 healthcare respirator. Do not put on an N95 respirator on the patient. The respirator is for healthcare professionals only. It filters air and therefore you get a lower concentration of oxygen. Placing one on a sick patient will make it difficult for them to breathe and will not help protect you since it is not fit tested on the patient anyway. A mask is sufficient for the patient and is much easier to breathe in. If possible, get a sample history of the patient, adding questions such as, have they traveled? If so, then where did they go? When did they start feeling sick? And do they have friends or family sick as well? If they are with someone who has spent time with the patient, ask if they feel ill as well. If so, you may need another EMS crew to assist in transporting more patients. If friends or family want to accompany the patient and are not showing symptoms, then give masks to them as well and have them drive to the hospital separately. Before bringing the patient in the transport vehicle, close the window or door of the driver compartment if there is one and make sure you have the vents as well as rear exhaust ventilation fans on. Remember to limit the amount of personnel treating the patient to reduce the risk of unnecessary exposure. 
The driver should then remove all PPE before entering the driver compartment. If there is a door or window to the patient compartment, the driver should leave the respirator on and keep the vents on throughout the transport. The combination of the rear exhaust ventilation fans in the back and the driver compartment vents in the front creates a negative pressure gradient in the patient area, helping to keep contaminated air out of the driver compartment. The driver should notify the hospital that they will be arriving with a PUI so the hospital can prepare a room and personnel for your arrival. Once at the hospital, follow your protocols on transferring patient care. In some cases, you may have to wait in the ambulance until an isolation room is prepared. In no circumstance should the patient be placed with other patients. Make sure to provide a thorough oral history to the hospital staff as all written documentation should be done after the call is completed. Make sure that it matches what you have told the staff. After the call is completed, doff all PPE and perform hand hygiene before starting documentation. Remember to document who was on the call as well as their contact with the patient, such as no patient contact or direct patient care. While doing so, leave the doors of the ambulance open to allow fresh air to replace the contaminated air. The CDC states that leaving the doors open while patient transfer and documentation is completed should allow for sufficient air changes in the vehicle. When airing out and cleaning the vehicle, remember to be at a safe distance from public foot traffic to prevent exposure to the public. The CDC states that a gown and gloves is all that is needed for cleaning unless there is a potential for a splash hazard. In my opinion, I would continue wearing an N95 respirator while cleaning. Even with the doors open, you are still in a confined space where a sick patient was. After a thorough cleaning is completed, it should be safe to remove the respirator. When cleaning, use products with EPA-approved emerging viral pathogens claims to sanitize the ambulance. Here is a list of some common cleaning supplies that are approved for use against COVID-19. Lysol disinfectant spray, Clorox disinfecting wipes, and Sani cloth prime germicidal wipes, to name a few. A detailed list of more cleaners can be found in the links below. Remember to use the instructions of each specific cleaner, as some need to remain wet on surfaces longer than others. The CDC states that when using alcohol-based cleaning products, such as hand sanitizer or cleaning wipes, a percentage of at least 70% should be used. Only use hand sanitizer if you cannot wash your hands at the time. Remember that hand sanitizer never replaces hand washing, which should be done as soon as possible. Make sure you have enough biohazard bags on hand when cleaning the ambulance. Use them to dispose of PPE, cleaning supplies, and disposable items used on the patient according to your protocols. After sealing the bag, remember to dispose of all biohazardous materials in a marked disposal container that is leak and puncture proof. Start by cleaning the cot. Remove all linens and dispose of them properly. Some agencies have their own linens, which they will need to wash themselves, while others use the hospital linens, which can be placed in the soiled linens container. Whichever the case, always follow your protocols on the handling of soiled linens. While cleaning the cot, pay special attention to the padding, seat belts, handles, and bed rails. If the wheels are contaminated, Clean them as well before putting the cot back in the ambulance. When cleaning the inside, it is best to clean the whole patient compartment area, including the floors. Clean all the walls, cabinets, ceiling grip bars, lighting and AC control panels, door handles inside and out, as well as any reusable supplies such as blood pressure cuffs, stethoscopes, and pulse oximeters. Clean all equipment that was used such as jump bags, stair chairs, reeves, backboards, oxygen equipment, etc. It is extremely important to clean everything that was used on the call to prevent further spread of the virus to future patients and crew members alike. The last topic I will be covering is exposure. In EMS, we are always worried about getting attacked or even shot, but the thought of being exposed to an infectious disease may never cross our minds. There is a mentality where healthcare providers think that will never happen to me. This is faulty thinking which will only lead you and those around you to get hurt or ill. One accidental needle stick or poorly fitted respirator can compromise your body to the virus. 
That is why it is important to always remain cautious and not to rush when you are dealing with a dangerous situation. Remember that you are number one. If you do not feel safe, then remove yourself from the situation until it is resolved or until you are fully protected. Exposure can happen at any point during patient care. That is why it is important to know ways of exposure to the hazard so you can prevent it from happening in the first place. Some ways of exposure are you had close contact with the patient without proper protection, you came into direct contact with an infected patient's body fluids, your PPE is faulty, your PPE has become damaged, or your PPE has become overly soiled such as getting blood or vomit seeping through your respirator. If you believe you have been exposed to an infectious disease, remove yourself from the situation and quarantine yourself as soon as possible, and contact your EMS supervisor. Each agency has their own guidelines and protocols, so make sure to get familiar with how your agency operates. I oftentimes see sick healthcare providers treating patients, which should never be the case, especially now with COVID-19. If you are feeling unwell at any time, immediately notify your supervisor and self-quarantine. It is imperative that you stay home when you are sick. Remember, not everyone has the same reaction to the virus. To some people, it feels like a cold, and to others, it may lead to pneumonia. If you are sick, you will only put your patients as well as your crew members' safety in jeopardy. If you are not sure how your company operates in this aspect, Talk with your supervisor about your agency's sick leave policies. If you have made it this far, I want to thank you for taking the time to educate yourself with this video. We have learned what coronavirus is, where it originated, how it spreads, and what steps we should take to protect ourselves as well as those around us. If you found this video helpful and informative, then please like, share, and subscribe. You are all heroes, and I hope and pray we will stay safe and sound as we continue to help those in need of our care.